Hello everyone, this is Professor Bruce Hartpence back with another networking video. We are going through chapter 4 in the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching and this is part 2 of the series. So if you missed part 1, feel free to go back and watch that one first as I am going to refer to some of that content from time to time. So we got a little bit of review here. Uh, you may recall that we were talking about some of the similarities and differences between just straight up switches and VLANs. So if we take a look at the image here on the left, that is a pair of switches interconnected with a router. And if we think about them in terms of VLANs, we can actually collapse this topology and just use one switch to accomplish the same, same sort of goal. And remember here that these two topologies are logically the same but physically very different. And that's really one of the things that VLANs affords us. Now one of the other things about VLANs is that the ports do not have to be organized in any particular fashion. Now we can divide things up very straightforward in a very straightforward fashion. Floors, buildings, groups of folks working together and make things uh, very numeric and very organized. But you can also add and subtract ports from VLANs any old time you want. But our discussion thus far has been all about a single switch. But what happens when you start adding more switches? Well, before we answer that question, maybe we should talk about why interconnecting switches with no VLANs works at all. And the thing that we have to remember is that in the MAC address table or the source address table on a switch, we also have a VLAN indication there. So when we connect two switches together, uh, and you can see here in this topology that I have two switches connected together and remember that all of the ports by default are in VLAN 1. So the real reason this works or the more in-depth discussion is not just that you've hooked up two switches with a crossover cable or via the uplink port is that because by default all the ports are also in the same VLAN and that's a, another key idea to remember. But what happens when we start adding VLANs? We can see that if we just add VLANs willy-nilly, all of a sudden things break down. Because as you may recall from the last video, VLANs are a boundary. Layer 2 unicast, multicast, and broadcast traffic does not cross VLAN boundaries, not without some help. And so when you just simply interconnect two switches together with a crossover cable, you may or may not be connecting the same VLAN together, and even if you did, all the other VLANs would be isolated. So again, just like uh, VLANs were a solution for one particular problem, now that we've done VLANs, we have to have another solution to provide full connectivity. In this case, our solution is trunks. Now trunks are a very traditional sort of word or idea. Most people, when you say trunk to them, and especially if you're from a telco background, you think of aggregated pipes or large links, multiplexing, those kinds of ideas to get more and more data between two point-to-point -point locations. And that is actually a very common idea. For data networkers, the primary use of a trunk link is to convey VLAN information and that's really really important. So if you hook up a trunk between switches it's usually just one line and the goal was not to have more capacity or anything else although we certainly could do that. In this case what we're mostly concerned about is getting information about VLANs between switches. Now that means that trunk lines and the switches connected to those trunk lines have to be VLAN aware. And what VLAN aware means is that we understand this idea of tagging or VLAN IDs. And we understand how to get traffic from one VLAN to another. So this also means that trunked traffic does not look exactly like standard Ethernet traffic. Now every once in a while you'll see a trunk shared, but that's not a really big part of of their use and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it but the really big idea here is that when you interconnect switches with the trunk line things are changed on that trunk line. So let's take our same two switches and let's correct the topology. What we've got here is that the two switches are interconnected via a trunk line. 
And underneath the trunk line, it says 802.1Q, and I'll talk about that here in a second, but I'll just mention it because that is the industry standard. Now to clarify, this shows an indication that the VLANs or the trunk lines are in VLAN 1. And that's not exactly accurate. What I would rather have you remember is that trunk lines are not typically members of any particular VLAN. So the minute you make something a trunk, it actually removes it from the VLANs. I'd also like to point out in this diagram that there's one router. So the really nice thing about this is that when you're trunking, the VLANs on different switches can be reached even though the router isn't necessarily connected to that switch. What is important is that the router has to have an interface or a connection to each VLAN that you want to route to. Sometimes we want to isolate a VLAN, but that's a different thing. All right, so another, another idea here that we introduced last time is that that router here looks like an external device, but we also might be dealing with multi-layer switches. In that case, the router is actually an internal function of the switch, and that's fine too. So how does this work? Let's take a little more in-depth look at an example. And in this particular case, let's pretend that PC1 is sending traffic to PC2. So there's a whole bunch of things that have to happen here. First up is that PC1 generates an Ethernet frame. Now I say Ethernet in particular because it is very much a straight up Ethernet frame. There's nothing special about it. That also means that PC1 has no idea that VLANs are going on. The frame gets to switch 1, and switch 1 processes its SAT. And we know now that because there are VLANs, this particular Ethernet frame, even if it is a broadcast, it doesn't necessarily go to all ports on that switch. Now if it's a broadcast, or if we don't know where PC2 is, we're going to send this out or flood it to everywhere on the VLAN for PC1. But we're also going to send it out the trunk line. When it gets to the trunk, and here's the special part, when we send it out the trunk line, because PC1 is on VLAN 2 here, the uh, Ethernet frame is tagged with VLAN 2. So that means that there's more information contained in the Ethernet frame. And we can no longer call this a straight up Ethernet frame. It is very, very similar. I mean, it, source and destination, MAC addresses, etc., etc. We'll take a look at one here. But what is different is that it's not just the IP packet or the ARP message included in the frame. It is got tagging. And so this is sent across to the other switch. So that we process the SAT, we tagged it, and we send it over to the other switch. And the second switch takes a look at the VLAN tag and then says, all right, this is destined for VLAN 2, and forwards it out all of the ports on VLAN 2. But it also strips off that 802.1Q header, removes it, and then forwards it on based on its source address table. And that's how PC2 eventually gets it. Now that's just one way. Sounds like a lot is going on, but that's the basics of a very simple transmission between switches using VLAN tags. Now I've mentioned that we've got a trunk link here, and in the previous example, PC1 had no idea that there were VLANs being used on the topology. This brings up the two major types of link or port. When you add a node to a VLAN, that node is using what's called an access port. It doesn't know anything about VLANs. A trunk line does understand VLANs and a trunk line uses tagged frames to forward traffic. And again, I'll show you exa an example of a tagged frame here in just a minute. The industry standard trunking protocol is 802.1Q. So if you are gonna connect different vendor switches together or even same vendor, it's a really good idea to use 802.1Q. It'll be understood everywhere. 802.1Q uses the concept of internal tagging. So the Ethernet frame has a different protocol type that it's encapsulating. And we'll see here in our example that there are a couple of other fields here, but our, our primary use is the VLAN tags. Our secondary use for 802.1Q is that you can actually prioritize traffic using 802.1Q. And here is 
a general description of how things are put together. We have the original header and then you inside this Ethernet frame you stick in the internal tags. But of course now the frame has changed so another CRC has to be calculated. That's different than the original frame that might have been generated in our example by PC1. And here is an 802.1Q tagged frame. So I want to point out a couple of things here. Let's take a look at the arrows first. The type field is now 8100. This tells all the nodes involved in the transmission that we have 802.1Q tagging being used here. And if we go down to the second arrow, there's that priority or, uh, or prioritization that I was mentioning earlier. But most important is the third arrow here showing the VLAN tag. Now in this case, the binary and the base 10 look the same, but the VLAN ID here was VLAN 101. Now I have circled here the IP header type field that would normally be in the Ethernet frame. So it's still here, it's just moved because we inserted this .1Q header. So after the 802.1Q header, we have this indication that we are now encapsulating IP. And from here on, the frame or packet is the same as we would expect without the tagging. The tagging is the inclusion of a VLAN ID in this particular frame. Now the other non-industry standard proprietary solution that we see sometimes is Cisco uh, trunking. and we, Cisco has their InterSwitch link or ISL tagging and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it but it is, it is out there and if you have a Cisco collection of devices or you're a Cisco shop you have the capability to use a different sort of tagging. And that's what it looks like in general. This is a capture example of an ISL trunk frame. And again, I'm not going to go over all the fields here, but this is what it looks like. The big difference here is that this is an external tag as opposed to internal. So the Ethernet frame doesn't have this inserted inside. It's actually prepended to the Ethernet frame. I think that a discussion about VLANs and trunks has to include some mention of pruning. There are times when you do not want all of your VLANs to propagate throughout the entire network or you might not want to have all VLANs be able to reach all other VLANs. So in that case you can decide to exclude transmissions to or from a particular VLAN through the process of pruning. And all you do is on that particular trunk line you indicate that traffic for a particular VLAN is denied. By default on Cisco devices, all VLANs are allowed. Well, that will about do it for this VLANs and Trunks Part 2. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found it instructional. Remember that this was Chapter 4 in the Packet Guide to Routing and Switching from O'Reilly. Next time we will start in on Chapter 5, of course, and the Routing Information Protocol, or RIP. Feel free to stop by BruceHartpence.com. I try to add stuff there on a regular basis. And feel free to take a look at the packet of the week. Thanks again for listening. Thanks again for watching. And may your packets always reach their destinations.